Welcome to the Sports Card Lessons Podcast. I'm your host, Big Ken. Whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on streaming service, please like, subscribe, and definitely leave some feedback. Welcome, everyone. Just a reminder before we jump into today's episode, I'll be traveling to Philly, the Philly show Saturday with Rob Gerard, sports card therapist. So if you're going to be down there, please hit me up, send me a message, and we'll try to meet up. On today's episode, an interview I've been looking forward to since I first scheduled it. I'm excited to have on the show today, Brian Dwyer, president of Robert Edward Auctions. Brian, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, Ken. Looking forward to it. I am too. I am too. And and, and I'm really looking forward to uh, jumping into you know, the uh, Robert Edward auctions, but I want to start with you first. I just want to get a, a little little background. Talk to me uh, about your hobby journey. When did it start? What were some of the first cards you had in your collection? Yeah, so I mean, I got my start probably like many of the listeners at a very young age. I was five or six years old, um, 1992, and I got uh, a set of baseball cards for my birthday. And I locked myself in my room and sorted them every which way. I still count one of those cards that I found in that set among my, my favorites, the, the 92 Cal Ripken. Um, and, and that was really what set me off on this path. So um, here we are. What kind of what kind of cards have you collected over the years, like just for yourself when you so obviously it was baseball, like when you first started. But what was what was your collection? What would, what would be something you're, you were out chasing? Yeah. So I, I was, uh, always chasing the new release when I was first getting my feet wet in the hobby, going with my parents, buying packs or complete sets at, at the local department stores or, or card shops. Then once I hit my teenage years, the internet really became the, the behemoth that we know it as today. And mm -hmm. I was doing a lot of trading and I, and I was about 12 or 13 years old when I was introduced to vintage. And so I joined a couple free trading vintage websites at that time where I would send cards back and forth through the mail with, with fellow collectors. And that really got me tasting the 60s and 70s and, and even a couple 50s. Um, mm. And then as I went into college, I just said, well, let me see if I can go back further. So eventually I built sets from 1952 to the present, which um, I'm very proud of. And then in recent years, I've shifted to uh, baseball, basketball, you know, I have a Jordan rookie, I have a Gretzky rookie, all these greats of uh, these other sports, because we do way more than baseball. So I, I like to uh, practice what I preach. So you you collected these sets through high school and through college as well. So that's interesting, because that's when most people, you know, right, when they get to that they discover girls at some time, you know, in, in, in high school, it's like the cards go away and they don't come back until, you know, much, you know, further after college. So that's interesting. Not, not to say you didn't ever discover girls, but that just your love, important, right? <laughs> yeah. It, it just shows your love, you know, for the, for the hobby that, you know, you, you, you stayed with it. Cause most people, when, when we talk to them, this is their journey. They're in, they jumped out and they came back in again. So it's, I always find it fascinating to talk to people who never stepped out, who stayed in, because these are the people that have the most amazing collections, right? Because there was nothing that you said at any time that you said, well, I'm not so much into this anymore. So maybe I'm just going to let that go or I'll sell it because I want to buy a car or something like that. And then 10 years later, you're like, oh, my God, I should have never sold that card. Now that I'm back in the hobby, I'll never be able to replace it. So, yeah, it's just such an interesting, interesting uh, thing to talk to people who have stayed in the hobby the whole time. Yeah, I'm, I'm incredibly passionate about it. I love it. It's seen me through some. Uh some great life milestones and, and baseball cards actually paid for my first car, believe it or not. So I was, I was selling on eBay um, pretty, pretty frequently as a teenager, high schooler going into college. And I was, you know, buying, selling and trading on eBay and, and other online venues. And, and I bought my first car with baseball card money. So uh, yeah, I've been in it for a long time. Oh. Now, did you ever go to shows, set up at dealers, anything like that? Or was a lot of it just online? 
Yeah. So uh, where I grew up, there were limited shows. So my exposure was mostly online. I did have some exposure to some some larger regional shows. I went to my first national in 2003. Uh, I was uh, 16, 17 years old. My grandparents took me down to Atlantic City. Um, and, uh, you know, as I got to college and I could drive, I started branching out and going to more of these shows. I joined SGC which took me all over the country and into Canada uh, as a professional at these trade shows. And then now to this day, we continue to set up. We'll be in Philly. We'll be in Chantilly. We'll be, uh, you know, all over. We do shows in California and Texas and, and Boston. Mm -hmm. So uh, the mm -hmm. show circuit is, is vibrant and alive and well. Mm -hmm. how, how long have you been with uh, Robert Edward Auctions? This is uh, going on 11 years. Mm -hmm. So I joined in uh, the spring of 2012. Nice. And you started there as did you, you didn't come in as the president? Did no, you? I didn't. I was yeah. uh, I was the consignment director. So it was a very small staff at that point in time. There was one auction a year and uh, I was tasked with going out and, um, you know, utilizing the relationships that I had built through my own collecting network and, and working at SGC and bringing in material for auction with the goal of expanding. So hmm. we in 2012 were doing one auction a year. Uh, we expanded to two, which was revolutionary for us and the hobby at the time. And now we're doing 10 or 11 auctions a year. We have three catalog auctions and seven encore monthly online auctions now. So mm -hmm. the calendar has really expanded since I started. Mm -hmm. And it, was it a company that you kind of came in and drew, uh, you know, grew? Like how many people were working there? Like when you came in to versus to 11 years later, it's, uh, how many people are there now? Yeah. So I was the third employee and wow. there's 23 employees now. Um, so it was a very small company. They put out a tremendous product with a very small, uh, small team. But, you know, as the hobby grew and as the company grew, the demand for our services became greater. The, uh, the amount of material, frankly, that was out there just, just became greater as people had more access to the internet and social media to see what, what was going on in the hobby and capitalize on some of these trends. So yeah, the company's grown considerably. It's been pretty exciting. Wow. Nice. So I know when I was collecting years ago, I don't ever remember auction houses, right? I'm sure they were there, but I never remember them. So that I kept come back into the hobby a few years later and they seem like they're such a big, uh, a big part of the hobby. Can you talk to me a little bit about the evolution um, of the auction house, you know, specifically with sports cards and the hobby. Yeah. So, I mean, we know on the, on the large scale that auction houses have been around for centuries and, and uh, you know, the Sotheby's and the Christie's of the world, they've, they've been doing this for a long time in the sports memorabilia world. We can go back and read periodicals from the 60s and 70s, and you'll see the concept of auctions at trade shows, or you'll see uh, you know, a group of collectors getting together and having an impromptu auction. But you know, to your point, I think the, the 90s really, with the advent of professional grading, uh, the advent of the internet, really made it so that companies needed to put themselves out there as um, you know, a service to collectors to verify all Authentic, authenticity, market material to a, a broad base of bidders and collectors. And so that's what we do. I mean, REA has been around for over 30 years now. And, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a service that's always in demand. And what do you see moving forward? Uh, you know, what, what the sports cards, like what, what part of the market do you feel? Um, and I'm not going to say it's ripe, you know, but but when you look forward with the auction, you know, what is it that you see where where you're going to evolve to? Yeah, this is a very exciting time. You know, anybody that's been paying attention, even if uh, you're just on the periphery of our hobby, has seen the last couple of years, there's been tremendous change. We've had more record breaking sales than ever before. You know, in 2021, we were able to sell a T206 Honus Wagner for $6.6 .6 million, which was the highest selling baseball card of all time at the time. And, and those were numbers that had only ever been dreamt of. And so mm -hmm. items like that, uh, the COVID pandemic, obviously people are sitting around with maybe more disposable income because they're not traveling. Uh, they've got free time. They're not commuting. Uh, they discovered hobbies for the first time or they rekindled passions. So, you know, all those factors have really led to our hobby being pretty robust from what I see. I mean, I, we started off this chat talking about how I've been in this for 
30 years already. Um, so I've seen some, some serious ebbs and flows, but the hobby is very strong. I'm excited for the future. I think that we're seeing technology really on the forefront of this industry, you know, whether it's social media, making it easier for people to buy and sell over the internet, uh, reaching a worldwide clientele. I mean, REA ships catalogs and, and material into more than 20 countries at this point in time. Um, social media is exciting. Live shopping, we're seeing eBay and whatnot and fanatics all come into this live shopping uh, environment, which will be interesting to, you know, to see if that gets traction in our industry. And then, you know, technology is also going to have the effect, I think, of, of consolidating, right? So um, auction houses weren't a thing in the 80s and 90s. Then there was a boom of auction houses. I think what you're going to see is some consolidation as uh, technology really forces people to uh, adapt. And, and that takes considerable resources. And it's something that we're investing very heavily in. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty bullish on the future for us and the hobby. Do you feel over the last few years with the boom of the pandemic, um, do you feel that there's cards that rare cards that you figured that you thought were very limited now are coming out in abundance. Like all of a sudden people are, you know, when they realize that the, 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 the hobby is taken off and the prices have gone, the values have gone up so much that all of a sudden people are going through their basements and their attics and grandpa's house and all these other places and coming up with these cards that, you know, maybe, maybe five years ago or seven years ago, you thought that, that's it. You know, we're really not going to see any more of those cards. And now all of a sudden, a lot more of these cards are coming are showing up. Yeah, absolutely. So you have people that are spending time going through their collections. You have people that are inheriting material. You know, in the last three years, we've seen, as I alluded to, that record setting Wagner. We've seen several Wagners come out during that period of time all set records. We've seen Baltimore News Ruth's trans transact for the first time in several years. Anecdotally, what we're seeing is, you know, we're getting fresh collections from people that that have been storing them away for many years. Uh, we just got in a 52 tops collection that had a new to the hobby 52 mantle, which is, you know, right behind me. And it's one of the pinnacles of our hobby. It also had this very obscure card, a Frank Campos Black Star that you know, people never really knew to exist until 10 or 15 years ago. And, and we're able to go through and we're able to research these and we're able to present these very cool cards to the hobby. And, and that Campos will be in, in our March auction. And then the 52 mantle and the rest of the set will be in our spring auction. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a lot of stuff coming out of the woodwork and it's not just baseball, you know, we're seeing people dig into their collections and, and get, uh, 86 Fleer Jordans, or we've got a couple great Jim Brown rookies that are in fresh, fresh finds for us coming up for auction. Wayne Gretzky rookies. Uh, we've got a Wilt Chamberlain ticket stub and program from his hundred point game. That's been in a family since that day coming up in our summer auction. So uh, that's the thing we love about our job. You never know what's going to be on the other end of that phone call or, or, or on the other end of the email. Yeah. And it must be exciting too. I mean, to get a call to come in, it must become the buzz around the office, right? If you get a call, somebody saying, oh, I have this collection of, you know, whatever it is, like the 52 tops. I mean, hearts must start beating and, and people are getting excited to see, you know, to and not because it's just coming to you, but just really just to get to see it, right? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, if, if we're doing our job right, the phones are ringing many times a day and the emails are coming in left and right. And so we're fortunate that we've developed the reputation to, to get this amazing material. Um, I alluded to the fact that we've grown the company to up to 23 employees. And that includes people that don't have the background in sports collecting that, that I do. So, you know, the other day we got in 200 Gaudis with several Ruths and Gehrigs in there. That was the first time that some of my newer employees had seen cards like that essentially come in off the street and, and now they're going to work their way through the process. Um, so it's fun to see those, those fresh finds that, you know, come, come out of the wild, but then it's fun to see the, the, the collector that's been at it 10, 20, 30, 60 years building, building their collections and then entrusting us with them. You know, we have a, a national chickle football set that's been a, a passion project for decades coming up in our auction. We're selling it card by card, very high grade, sevens, eights, eights and a halves. Um, you know, that's, that's been a decades long labor of love. So um, our consignments and our consigners come in a variety of different forms and, and that's fun. So you mentioned um, 
a couple of times talked about the March auction and then the spring auction and then the summer auction. So you do a monthly auction, but then you do a, a, a quarterly auction as well. Can you just talk to me the differences uh, to those? Yeah. So for the longest time, REA was known for doing one blockbuster spring catalog auction. And then when I came on board, we expanded to spring and fall. Uh, subsequently, we added spring, summer and fall. So we do three seasonal catalog auctions. Uh, those catalogs are six, 700 pages. They might do 15 to $20 million each in sales. They're going to have just incredible material. 2021, we registered, or excuse me, we, we started the concept of these monthly auctions. And that was in response to the demand that we had for our services, people wanting to bring items to market quicker than those seasonal auctions. And they knew that we had the bidder base, they knew that we had the clientele, and they knew that we could put their items out um, you know, effectively and, and draw in great, great prices for them. So those Encore auctions, they run monthly in those non-catalog months. And they've been great. They've been very well received. This March auction that we have coming up has uh, nearly 3,400 lots in it. A uh, dozen Gaudi, Ruth Skerrigs and, and, and Hall of Famers like that. Tito Six Cobbs, uh, Alcindra Rookie and a seven and a half. I mean, just, just tremendous stuff. And it just because it's a non-catalog auction doesn't mean that it's not going to have these head turning, eye-popping uh, items. You know, we got $612,000 for an 86 Fleer Jordan and a 10 in one of our monthly auctions. So uh, they're very exciting. There's a good mix of material, modern football cards, modern basketball cards. We have some Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh! You know, there's, there's literally something for everyone. So uh, yeah, we're up to about 10 auctions a year right now. Mm -hmm. And is there any limit on, on, you know, what the starting price is on any of those, like, like, obviously a more expensive card is going to start very high, but do you have other cards like a Pokemon or a basketball, a football, anything like that, that starts at a low, you know, at a lower price and works like, I'm just, just trying to gauge, you know, price wise, or is it all above a certain price or is it from $10 right on up? Yeah. So that's the beautiful thing about our monthly auctions. So these encore auctions, every item starts at $10. So that Michael Jordan rookie card that went for $612,000 started at 10 bucks. And that really speaks to our reputation and the confidence that our clients have with us to, to reach the right buyers. Um, mm -hmm. The month, excuse me, the catalog auctions, which just as a frame of reference, I have a catalog here. It's like the old yellow pages. So we send these out every catalog auction three times a year. Um, those are going to have items that are starting at a higher price point. They are going to start somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 40% of expected value. And the items in those auctions will generally sell for 500 to to $1,000 or more and uh, upwards of seven figures. You know, we, we have a Clemente rookie and a nine coming up in spring. And the last sale was over a million dollars for that card. So wow. uh, something for everyone. Hmm. So I know when I'm buying cards, certain cards I just will not buy if they're not authenticated, right? Like a Gretzky rookie or a Jordan rookie or things like that. Um, you talked about having 23 employees. So it, it's not as if you have a, you know, a whole section there of people just trying to authenticate these cards. So how do you authenticate if they're coming in raw and not graded? How do you authenticate it? And, you know, what are you looking for to see if they're real or fake? Because I'm sure you guys probably get a, a ton of, I mean, I'm not going to say a ton, but I, I bet you there's a lot of things that come in that people may think they're real. And then you're like, no, I'm sorry, these are fake. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, uh, oddly enough, we do have a whole department of authenticators in our <laughs> office. So we're, we're very privileged to have one of SGC's former uh, senior graders. He spent over 15 years at SGC uh, prior to coming to work for us. And so he's in charge of overseeing the authentication of all of our raw cards that come in. Um, you know, what is he looking for? He's looking for, um, you know, inconsistencies in the print, inconsistencies in the in the text, inconsistencies in the edges, all all these things that are going to be red flags. Um, we do get inundated with fakes and reprints, and they're not necessarily from people that are, you know, trying to get one over on us. They're from people who, uh, you know, 
the 1980s were 30 or 40 years ago already. And so when somebody says, oh, I've had this for 40 years, it must be real. It must be old. They, they don't realize that they're sitting on a, on a reprint. And so, mm-hmm. you know, part of our job is educating people. Part of our job is putting out resources where they can learn about what separates a real card from, from a fake card or a reprint. And, and that's, um, you know, what our buyers rely on us for. They, they know that when they come to REA, they're going to get vetted material and they're going to get authenticated material. They're going to know that we've made the decision to grade key cards where, you know, it's going to protect our seller's interests and our buyer's interest. So mm-hmm. we do a lot of work behind the scenes that I don't know people always, uh, always realize. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. You just mentioned that. And I never thought of, about that until you just said that. So getting a card in, getting a raw card in that you would you know, say to whoever owns it, hey, it's better off if we grade this first before we, before we put it out. Number one, it's authenticating the card. And number two, it gives the bidders a better idea of, you know, of, of grade because we know, you know, it's, it's interesting when I, when I'm, when I'm online and I'm looking at things and I'm in groups and people will be like, Oh yeah, that's that's a seven for sure, or it's a six for sure, or that's real or that's fake. I think to myself, I mean, people get paid big money to know, you know, if this is real or fake or you know what it's gonna grade at. And it's interesting how you get all these people that will get online and they'll be saying they know for sure it's this or that. But how how often and is it all the cards? Do you grade do you grade just about all the cards if they come in raw? Do you grade them before you put them up? And is do you sell any that are raw? Yeah, we, we sell tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of cards every year that are raw. So our relationship with grading is we're going to recommend that a client get cards graded if it's going to add value to it, right? So we don't necessarily need to spend 20 or $30 to have PSA or SGC or Beckett tell us that a card has a big gaping hole in the center of it. So where can we spend money to make money for our clients? And where can we spend money to give that buyer on the other end of the computer the confidence? Because like you alluded to, when you're in these Facebook groups, you get 30 different answers and you get 30 different opinions. And by and large, they're all wrong because you can't accurately evaluate condition and all these little idiosyncrasies on some of these cards from a, from a scan. Um, so, you know, we look at grading as a value add service. We look at it where, you know, where can we instill confidence and where can we add, add value to the, to the, to the client's bottom line. And also where can we provide that expertise and service of just physically handling, getting the cards from point A to point B, you know, for a lot of people, it's very daunting to ship cards for a lot of people. It's impossible to ship cards. We just recently worked with two consigners who traveled to the USA, one from Australia and one from Spain, because it was easier for them to come meet us here and then have us essentially shepherd their cards through the grading process than it would be for them to deal with it themselves as international clients. And so those are instances where, you know, we're able to to handle everything for the client. We're able to make the recommendations and we're able to, especially in the cases of both of these individuals, um, really add significant value. And, and when you do get calls, at what point do you say it's better for us to get on a plane or in a car and go, you know, to our customer versus just send it to us and let us look at it? Yeah, so the, the calculations uh, vary on, on a situation by situation basis. So, you know, sometimes we're dealing with uh, very savvy collectors who are comfortable shipping a card, even if it's of incredible value from from them to us. And we can advise them on how to do it uh, safely and securely and insured, and we can provide insurance where needed. Um, and then other times we're dealing with people who maybe had a family member die, or maybe they stumbled upon something at a garage sale and and they're petrified of losing it or, or, or shipping it incorrectly. And so for us, the, the calculation becomes, you know, what's this worth and, and how can we, how can we get it to us if, if, if that's what we want? We're very fortunate in that we have a, a staff that's based uh, pri- primarily in our New Jersey office, but we also have full-time representatives in Chicago, Southern California, and Dallas. And so that really allows us to, in those special situations, reach people quickly and effectively 
and kind of uh, uh, smooth over any of their apprehensions uh, about getting us their material. So every case is different, but uh, you know, if it's, if it's great material that we know our clients are going to like, we're going to do everything we can to get it in here. Right. Any, any surprises, any phone calls you said, Oh, we're going to go look at say card a, and you showed up and there were, you know, it was much bigger and better than, than you thought, or is it mostly you kind of know exactly every time you've shown up, it's really exactly what, what you knew you were going to look at. Well, so typically we don't get on a plane without having a fairly good idea of what we're walking into, but that doesn't always mean that we, we have all the information. So a perfect example, we had a collection in Iowa and we knew from the information that we had received that there was sufficient valuable and sufficient material for us that was a good fit for our monthly auctions and our catalog auctions. And so we sent a team of guys out there. And when they got there, they discovered a barn full of unopened boxes and packs. And it took eight pallets uh, shipped back via FedEx freight from Iowa to our New Jersey office. And you can actually read about the details if anybody's interested on our website. We have a consigner stories part of our website and it tells stories of exactly what you and I are talking about right now. How does that phone call come in? How does uh, REA decide that we're a good partner for that for that consigner? And, and how do we make heads and tails of it once it's in our auction so that you, uh, you, you know, you see it on those pages of the catalog and and you don't know what we went through to get it. So it's it's a fun kind of peek behind the curtain. Yeah. Love those stories, right? Those those are always the best stories. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what keeps us so, going. So let me ask you a question for collectors. Mm -hmm. Your opinion. Better to complete full sets or just go out and get handpicked the cards that you know that that you wanted out of that set. So I, to be honest with you, I don't know that there's a one size fits all answer. You know, I, I have always advocated that people collect what they like. Uh, doing that has allowed me to be part of this hobby for 30 years uninterrupted, like we were talking about before. You know, I, I, I find what I like, I follow my passion, and the passion has never waned for me. Um, that being said, if somebody came to me as a novice and said, look, I'm looking to get into this for the first time, I would say that uh, my best advice would be, unless you have some significant attachment to a set, you're probably better off putting your money into key singles and 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 these blue chip players. Um, you know, set collecting is something that people of my generation are are not really familiar with. You know, we we could go to a a Walmart and buy 700 cards in 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 one fell swoop. We didn't have to open up packs. We didn't have to, um, you know, labor over building the set for a six month period. And so going forward, it'll be interesting to see if people in kind of that next generation um, gravitate to set building. And if they find it an interesting endeavor, I think what's most likely is that they'll say Mickey Mantle, Babe Ruth, Ty Cobb, Luke Gehrig, Michael Jordan, Jim Brown, Wayne Gretzky, you know, these are the guys that we want to focus on. And that's the the type of material that has staying power. So it'll be interesting. But if you're doing this as a collector, collect what you love. You, you really can't go wrong. Is there is there more value in the full sets? Now, I know you said you've been collecting sets from 52 on. So mm -hmm. is there and, and I think I probably know the answer, but I'm going to, you know, ask what you think. Is there is there more value in a full set? Or going and doing what you just said, going to each year and just handpicking all the, you know, all the goats, all the chase cards in those years. Yeah. So, I mean, look at, look at the 52 top set, for example. So you've got the mantle, which is obviously the key. You've got Jackie Robinson, you've got Willie Mays, Eddie Matthews. You've got a whole bunch of really significant cards from in there. If I were to sell the, the set whole, I don't know that I would necessarily realize the most money uh, as I would if I broke out some of those keys, because you're going to have people that are on somewhat of a finite budget or some way of a, uh, you know, a focus to their collection where they're going to say, I, I don't want the other 400 cards. I only want this one or two. So that's really been the beauty of these encore auctions for us is that we can go in and we can size up a collection and we can say what's going to maximize value for our client. And we can, 
put a mantle out on its own. We can put high numbers individually in our encore auction. We can put Willie Mays in as a featured lot. Um, you know, there, there's, there's, there's a lot of different ways to collect. Mm -hmm. And, and for selling, I mean, for on your end, when you get mm -hmm. the whole sets, would you move a whole set or is it all individuals? So totally, totally depends on condition. You know, we're, we're, we're breaking up that national chickle football set that I alluded to earlier because it's really high grade. And we know that the value on a card by card basis is sufficient. We know that there's significant demand for all those cards. We know that they're all going to do well. We're breaking up a 48 leaf baseball set because the Babe Ruth is an eight and the Satchel Page is a six and the Jackie Robinson's a six and the Ted Williams is a seven we know that there's demand in these really high grades for all those cards. But if you look through our catalog, we sell dozens of sets fully complete because the condition maybe doesn't justify breaking it out. Um, you know, we, we feel like we can maximize it within that, that budget, uh, that dollar value. We can maximize it by selling it intact. So there's, there's really no one size fits all. And that's the expertise that we bring to the, relationship you know we're going to size it up and we're going to make the decisions because we're we're really incentivized to get you the most money mm -hmm. and what are some of your favorite cards of all time whether it's through the auction or just your personal cards what is what are what are your favorite cards yeah so i mean the 92 cal ripken that i that i mentioned earlier that really got me started i'm a big fan of the 52 mantle i've owned several of those over over the years i still remember the first time that i saw one uh, T206 Honus Wagner, anytime we see one, it's very special. And, and you know, we, we $6.6 .6 million, we, we held the record for a Honus Wagner. Um, I'm really becoming enamored with, with some of these non-baseball cards though. You know, we, we have Charizard Pokemon. I, I was not, I was not a collector of Pokemon growing up, but I am gaining exposure through these offerings that we have in our auctions. Um, I love the, the Lou Alcindor rookie from 69 tops. So we got a great 7.5 coming up. Uh, I love Gretzky's rookie. I think the Opeachy with the rough cut is, is really just a great card. And I think it presents really well. I think it's uh, much rarer than the tops version, which, you know, is, is, is fun for, for collectors to chase. Um, so I, I, I love all cards. I joke, jokingly tell people I've got the best collection in the world every month. <laughs> yeah. you know, you got every day, right? All you got to do is right. go to work. You, you, never right? know, you, know, uh, you never know what's going to walk through the door. Yeah. Now, now, working in this business and being around cards all day, do you, do you ever find time on your own just to go, you know, whether it's online or, or it's to a local card show or just like, just be part of the hobby. Like most of us are, do you ever get time to get out and, and, and do that? And do you enjoy that? I do. I love it. I love opening up boxes of, of modern product. I buy a case of some product every year and we, we open up packs randomly in the office or on auction night. Uh, this last weekend, I went to a local card shop and I bought some hanger boxes and I opened them up with my, my three-year-old daughter and my four-year-old nephew. And, uh, you know, just basic cards, not super expensive, but just really fun to uh, for me as a hobbyist to just look and see if I'm going to get anything special, but, you know, as a dad to, to pass along that passion and as an uncle to pass along the, the interest in sports and, and sports cards. So, um, yeah, I participate as much as I can. Uh, I, I'm, I'm addicted to this stuff like most of us. <laughs> you know what? I, I think there's something to that because I'm the only one really in the hobby with extended family all around, whether it's here at home or if I go to my daughter's house or anywhere, when I travel, I always do that for whatever reason. I'll go buy a box of cards. I'll go to a, you know, a local card shop or, or wherever I can get some cards and I'll go back. So wherever I am, if I'm with my own kids, my, my grandkids, and as soon as I open a box, they all line up. It's like, they don't even know what they're doing, but they have their hands out. Give me a pack. I want to open it and I want to see these shiny cards inside. So, um, I, I think, you know, when they created this stuff, they really did it right because, you know, the people who don't even know what they're opening love opening it. So for people like us who know what's in that box, right, it's even more exciting. And you could say, you know, it, you, you know, you're addicted to it, but it's just, it's just pure fun, right? It is. It is. And you know, the, obviously packs and, and modern cards are, are getting more expensive, you know, $10,000 packs, 89 upper deck at a dollar, uh, blew the minds of hobbyists at the time. And now we're talking about $10,000 packs, but you know, you can still go and buy a hanger box for 
15 bucks and, and get some cheap fun. So yeah. I, I love it. And, uh, you know, I think that's going to be what keeps the hobby growing. You know, somebody yeah. getting exposed to modern cards today may be a vintage buyer in the future as they learn more. They may stay modern. I mean, there's again, there's really no wrong way to collect, which is what makes this so fun. And it's fun yeah. for us because we we have such a wide variety of collectors that 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 buy from us and sell with us. Um, we get to tell their stories. We get to learn about their collections. We get to put their items out to the world. And, and it's just fun. You know, I, I, I talk about that all the time on the podcast because I set up as a dealer and um, I'll never just go buy it. If it's a card that I really want, I'll never just go buy it anywhere. When I buy it, it needs to come with a story, right? Because it just makes the card feel that much better. And that's kind of what I hear you talking about, too. These cards that are coming, they're coming with a story. And sometimes the story is so much and the people are so much you know, more important than the card itself. The card was just an add on at the end. So, so the stories um, and the people and the conversation and the situation are so much, I feel are so much more important to the hobby than the actual card itself. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's one of our goals here, right? The reason that we put out this 700 page catalog is because we're telling the stories, we're imparting knowledge, we're, we're sharing, you know, we're taking what we're passionate about. We're taking what our clients are passionate about and we're putting it on paper and, and it's, it's establishing a legacy and it's establishing, uh, you know, an educational component to the hobby. And, and so we, we take that role and responsibility very seriously. Um, again, it's what, it's what keeps us going. And when we put out these auctions, whether they're the monthly auctions, uh, you know, that I was talking about or these big catalog auctions, mm -hmm. there's always something special and there's always something that's going to get you thinking and talking and, and get you excited. So I know there's the, your March auction is coming up now. Um, you want to just talk about, you know, where people can go to, 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 to get involved, to look what's in the auction, get involved in the auction, and maybe just talk about some of the highlighted, you know, pieces that are going to be in there. Absolutely. Yeah. So the March encore auction will go through, um, Sunday, March 19th. You can go to our website, robertedwardauctions.com. You can follow us on all major social channels, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. We post um, highlights, upcoming auction items, these consigner stories that I was talking about. Um, we have almost 3,400 items in that March auction. So there's some great high grade Mickey Mantle cards, 57 Mantle and an eight, 55 Tops Jackie Robinson and an eight, uh, 11 different Gowdy Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig's, uh, a Leaf Jackie Robinson and a four, an Alcindor rookie and a seven and a half, um, a Honus Wagner signed check, a Grover Alexander signed check, unopened boxes of 93 SP baseball, 81 Tops football. I mean, just a, a significant variety of items. Mm -hmm. And then our, our catalog auction launches April 6th, and that goes through the 23rd. And again, that's a behemoth. That's got about 3,700 items in it. You're going to see tickets. You're going to see photographs. You're going to see basketball, football, hockey, non-sports, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, um, you know, unopened packs, boxes, baseball cards. I mean, game used bats, autographs. I mean, you name it. If you're a collector, um, and, and you're interested in sports, you're going to find something in there that's, that's going to, that's going to stop you. And, and, and you're either going to bid on it or you're going to learn about it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely looking forward to it. Definitely looking forward to it. So Brian, if anyone wants to reach out to you, uh, tell them where they could, where they can find you. Yeah. So you can always message us through our website, which again is robertedwardauctions.com. You can email me at brian at robertedwardauctions.com. You can follow us on Instagram, Robert Edward Auctions. Uh, we're REA online on Twitter, Robert Edward Auctions on Facebook and TikTok. Um, you know, we're, we're pretty accessible. If you want a free appraisal, we're, we're happy to review your items, tell you what we think they're worth. If you have items to consign, we can discuss the process with you. If you want to sign up to bid or see one of our catalogs, you can go to our website. So, um, yeah, no, no shortage of opportunity. Good. Good. Well, Brian, thank you. Thank you for coming on today. It's really good time today chatting with you. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Love, love talking cards. Yeah. Yeah. We will talk soon. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. And if you like what you hear, please like, definitely subscribe. And most importantly, tell a friend and spread the word. Until next time, take care of yourselves and everyone around you.